to welcome everybody to this uh, final meeting in our Social Sciences Occasional Lecture Series, uh, final meeting of the series uh, in this semester. Uh, so um, let me uh, tell you a little bit about our speaker. I'm very happy to be able to introduce her. I've been wanting to uh, have her talk in this series for quite a while. And uh, her name is Angela Oberbauer, and she is a lecturer here at Mesa. Uh, in uh, political science. Uh, she has uh, lectured for us since uh, 1998. Uh, and she's a very professionally active person. She participates in uh, conferences, professional workshops, seminars. She publishes papers. Uh, in, in addition to that, she has a background in corporate management. So there's a versatile person for you. And uh, today's lecture is based on the paper that she gave first at the Oxford Roundtable Conference in July of 2007. Uh, in Oxford, England, and uh, in addition, she's given this paper uh, at, and I have to get this absolutely straight here, the American Political Science Association Teaching and Learning Conference uh, in February of this year, and in addition to that, and this, uh, these are our very prestigious, thank you by the way, Western Political Science Association Conference in March of this year, and it has also been published in the Forum on Public Policy Journal online in February of this year. So, the title of the paper is Separation of Church and State, Constitutional Policy in Conflict. Uh, and like I said, uh, this you can also read on the flyer. And by this, I want to welcome and you welcome. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, I first of all, I want to thank Nina, uh, Dr. Rosenjot, uh, for asking me and giving me this opportunity and thanking the social sciences department uh, for um, uh, having such a wonderful lecture series uh, for this campus. As we see right now with the election uh, and everything around it, how important the issue of religion is. And as political scientists, we're confronted uh, through, especially when we uh, touch the area of liberties uh, looking at and explaining to our students um, about the different freedoms and rights that they have, uh, and, and especially the First Amendment, the beginning of the First Amendment is always very, very interesting, the establishment and the, the free exercise clauses. Um, so, uh, as Nina brought out, I had been asked to write a paper and present it at the Oxford Roundtable at the University of Oxford last year. And it was quite a challenge for me uh, because you touch on these things lightly as a, an instructor. Um, um, but it turned out to be so fascinating to try to um, decide how I would approach a paper on religion. Uh, the title of the conference was actually Separation of Church and State. And um, uh, whether the separation, especially relevant to the United States, of uh, church and state uh, had already declined, or was it in decline? Um, and so um, it was important then for me uh, to look at well, what is this conflict about relevant to this issue of religion, separation of church and state, and who are the individuals uh, that are uh, interested in making any changes or continuing uh, having uh, these liberties that were put into the Constitution? So just giving you a little bit of background, so to give you an overview of the studies, with time, I sort of organized myself as to how I would approach this. And it then was very helpful in looking for the kind of information um, that I gathered, the research, uh, to put this study, this paper together. Uh, important overall is the Constitution itself and the policy within it on separation of church and state, which we will find out in a second, of course, is it within the First Amendment of the Constitution. But not only. Then looking at court rulings on prayer and religious 
activities in public schools, financial aid uh, to religious schools and churches, uh, rulings on uh, forwarding theocratic state uh, laws by the religious right. And by that, it was very interesting in the research uh, to understand, even myself, that the laws are have caused or have been the cause of much of this conflict for, for interest groups on both sides of this issue of separation of church and state, or rulings out of the Supreme Court, how they interpret those laws, be they from the national government or be they from state laws. Then looking at the interest groups that are in conflict with inter interpretation of the Establishment of Free Exercise Clauses. Um, what is the ideology a trend within the Supreme Court today, such the most important branch um, uh, of our government relevant uh, to final decision making and evaluation of all of these laws? What are the philosophies and goals of some religious and conservative right uh, interest groups uh, in America uh, that unite them with President George W. Bush, um, as we will see, I could not put down um, and itemize all of uh, the groups uh, that are uh, very much against a separation of church and state, uh, but picked uh, some of the most important uh, in, this, in this study. And finally, uh, have there uh, been accomplishments by the religious right? Because in looking at this study, we will find the religious right in our uh, country uh, have the desire to narrow a, any separation of church and state versus those who want to have the status quo of the meaning, the literal meaning of separation of church and state that is the Establishment Clause and Free Exercise Clause as interpreted uh, in the past by the uh, previous Supreme Courts. So as you see here, I picked someone uh, in our past who was very important to me in my um, study of uh, theories, uh, the Italian uh, philosophers, especially um, Dante Alighieri. We think, uh, you know, that this idea of separation of church and state is a new idea that is new uh, with our founding fathers uh, putting it into the, adding it to the Constitution with the Bill of Rights. Uh, but philosophers were talking about this a uh, long ago. And in uh, Dante's De Monarchia in 1312, he suggested the best way to attain order and justice for the civilians of Florence, and he even spoke of the world, is to have a temporal order to ensure the least conflict among men resulting in universal peace <coughs> without interference from the Pope of the Church. At that time, it was very focused on, of course, on the Pope of the Church of, the Roman, of, of Rome. In the constitutional um, policy, in the, in the original Constitution of 1787, already the Founding Fathers made a very clear statement in under Article 6. Um, it is the third passage. And they, it says, no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to public office or public trust. And this is in 1787. Then the Bill of Rights were added in four years later. Uh, any of the students in my classes in any of our uh, American government classes or in history, uh, American uh, um, 
history classes are aware of uh, the struggle that went on after the original Constitution uh, for four years practically, a uh, back and forth and back and forth uh, of the Founding Fathers and the society in these 13 um, uh, states of trying to uh, argue for or against uh, these additional rights and liberties, or liberties actually, at that time. Uh, well, it was signed in, in 1791, and most specifically for this conflict relevant to church and state, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. If that's exactly the way the First Amendment actually starts right off. And then it starts to us, continues about freedom of, of speech and etc. Uh, then in 1797, uh, with the uh, Tripoli Treaty between the US and the United States and Barbary states, uh, it was signed by the Senate that um, uh, in, uh, on June 10th, 1797. And it's very interesting, in, in the Article 11 of this paper, of this document, it states, as the government of the United States of America is not, in any sense, founded on the Christian religion, as it has in itself no character of enmity, against the laws, religion, or tranquility of Muslim men. These are the Arab countries that this treaty was uh, signed with. And as the said states never entered into any war or act of hostility against any Mohammedan nation, it is declared by the parties that no pretext arising from religious opinions shall ever produce and interruption of the harmony existing between the two countries. This was signed by President John Adams. I don't know if any of you have been looking uh, at the uh, Adams, John Adams um, presentation on HBO. Uh, he signed, he was the uh, second president of the United States. Uh, Secretary of State Pinckney also signed it and it was ratified by the Senate. And um, opponents of this treaty, who call this treaty invalid, it's not true, how could they possibly have known or understood the treaty because it was Arabic? Uh, that was not true. It was translated by Joel Barlow, and all of them, including the President, the Senate, his secretary, had read the document, understood what it said, and signed it in 1797. Then you have uh, President uh, Thomas Jefferson, who wrote, after he had become president, to the uh, Danbury Baptist Association. Uh, these were ministers in Connecticut in 1802, emphasizing a wall of separation, this is where we get that, that term, wall of separation. Uh, he did this because these uh, ministers who belong to this Connecticut Association were very worried. Um, the Baptists were minority, a minor minority religion in Connecticut. And in each of the 13 states, there were many uh, minority religions within states, and there had been <laughs> Uh, uh, even before uh, the Constitution, even before the Declaration of Independence, uh, there had been state dominations, uh, religious dominations, in each of the 13 colonies, even. So they were very worried that this, this new document, that this, this added First Amendment, did it only uh, protect um, the, the, uh, uh, were, were they only protected by the national government or were they also uh, protected uh, by their states? Because that's what they were actually worried about. 
because it's pretty clearly defined the Constitution, uh, this added um, First Amendment clarified, uh, at least, uh, that the national government, Congress, shall not encroach upon their rights in religion. Uh, so uh, this is something that he tried at his best to clarify, but he didn't, you know, say, uh, yes, 100%, um, it's a guarantee. Uh, he wrote a very diplomatic letter back to these individuals. And further, later in his life, Thomas Jefferson wrote uh, to former John Adams in, in 1817, because they exchanged so many letters. And, he's, uh, and uh, John, uh, President John Adams was a Unitarian. And he um, had discussed many, many times with Jefferson this issue of religion, church, separation, state. Um, Adams very much wanted it separate. So did um, uh, Jefferson. Uh, but it was now the issue of religion. How do you define religion? And Jefferson writes back to him, if by religion we are to understand sectarian, sectarian dogmas, all right, and that means a religion having its philosophies uh, document, these, these are its dogmas, in which no two of them agree, then your explanation is just and that this would be the best of all possible worlds if there were no religion in it, meaning the discourse, uh, the structure of government, all right? Now the courts begin to evaluate the establishment of free exercise clauses in the 19th century already. Reynolds versus United States. Now in my paper, I cover over 30 uh, rulings out of the court. Uh, and uh, here I bring about maybe 10 for you to some examples so you have a feeling for it. Reynolds versus the United States in 1879. This is about the territory of Utah. Uh, the U.S. District Court in the territory of Utah charged George Reynolds with bigamy in violation of the federal law that Congress had previously uh, enacted in section 5352, which stated you may not have two wives, in, or more than one wife, legal wife. And if you do, according to this law, you would be not only fined $500, but you would be put into jail, uh, into prison for five years. However, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of Reynolds, and Chief Justice Wattie wrote, Reynolds proved it was his duty uh, issued by his religion, the Mormon Church, to practice polygamy. And refusal, he, he uh, further said, said that Reynolds stated, would be damnation in the life to come. Therefore, he said, Congress cannot pass a law for the government of the territories, because the ones that were not states yet, we shall prohibit the free exercise of religion. All right, so he actually is supporting this, the First Amendment. Now later, in the 20th century, the courts are, are evaluating further any violations by state laws or the Congress or even local laws um, encroaching upon religious rights and uh, religious liberties. The, and to explain that further, uh, I'm telling you that uh, state laws that support a religious belief or are violating the establishment of free exercise clauses, uh, those are the ones they're looking at. All right. uh, the court begins to apply the 14th Amendment in 1868, uh, which not only in its first sentence um, defined who a citizen is, uh, but it also then, after the Civil War, clearly states no state shall deny any person um, their 
rights, their rights to due process of law and their equal protection under the law. All right. So through this, and what we call this, we uh, it has the 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 con it's called the concept of the incorporation theory because now in the middle of the 20th century, the court is now forcing states if they rule against a law that is violating these these religious rights, it will force the states to also abide by protecting those religious rights of individuals and churches as well. And it does that in a very famous case called Cantwell versus Connecticut, 1940. Um, Cantwell was a Jehovah Witness and he was playing a record and this record was uh, being very sarcastic against the Catholic Church in um, Connecticut. And the state, the state of Connecticut had a law um, that you can't, you can't do that. And there had been many Catholics, there was very predominantly, at that time, very predominantly Catholic state um, uh, um, uh, citizenship, citizenship. And they made a law that you can't do this. When it got to the court, however, the court ruled in favor of Cantwell because they said just because uh, he is uh, ex exercising his right of freedom of expression, he also, in his religious belief, has a right to express his religious belief and speak about it, even if it is on the streets of, of Connecticut. And you cannot, and he, why, why is he, the court asked, why is he disturbing the peace? Because that's what he was put in jail and to be put into prison for, okay? With Everson and the Board of Education in 1947, relevant to the Establishment Clause, the court upheld a state law that reimbursed parents for the cost of busing their children to parochial schools because the majority of the court felt the parents were only reimbursed, not the parochial school. So you see here, even though there were protests from the other side saying, hey, uh, you're using our tax dollars uh, and reimbursing them uh, to parents and to the school. Well, the court said, as long as that money goes directly to the parents, that is not directly to the school, and therefore it was fine. There was a recent case in Ohio some four years ago uh, and with the same kind of ruling out of the court. Uh, in Zorak uh, versus Carlson, the court upheld release time for religious practice in churches and synagogues, that is, students in classes who are, let's say, Jewish or um, Buddhist or whatever religion, Protestant of any, any uh, affiliated of Protestantism or Catholic, and they have to go, they, we, and you cannot stop them. Because we always have to remember, this First Amendment is uh, also, it is very much uh, relevant to public institutions. Uh, government, we're, we're part of government institutions here. Uh, you, uh, it's quite different when students are in parochial schools then there is, there is no issue. It's the issue begins to be an issue when they are in a public institution. Engels versus Vitali, uh, the court ruled that the New York's public school practice of beginning school days with a prayer, this is, was very, very important, uh, drafted by school officials violated the Establishment Clause. After the Civil War and until uh, pretty much this time, we had what we call, uh, what they call common schools. And these common schools were actually Protestant schools, uh, but public schools. They were like both. And they always had prayer, and they always had religious uh, uh, teaching in them. And that changed, that this changed. So this is, sort of, this is one of the real rulings 
that really put a, uh, an official uh, stop to that in public schools um, by the Supreme Court. Wallace versus Jaffrey uh, ruled against silent meditation in classrooms in public schools. Lee versus a Wiseman, prayer had been spoken before a graduation uh, ceremony. Justice Kennedy wrote the majority five to four opinion arguing prayer at graduation, this is a public institution, was un unacceptable coercion. All right. Santa Fe versus Doe in 2000, court ruled that students initiated prayer could not be spoken over public address systems. These were before football games, students were to um, address over the PA system, of, say a prayer, uh, and they could write the prayer themselves and uh, to uh, like a support system for the team. So therefore, the court has demonstrated a willingness to strike down any practices that might be likely to be perceived either as coercive or as a state endorsement of religion. Now, with scopes versus state, this has to do with the issue of ev evolution, the concept, the theory of evolution. And in 1927, actually in 1925, uh, Tennessee enacted a law called the Anti-Evolution Act and further down, you're going to see in Arkansas, a couple of years later, they also uh, enacted uh, the same law. And uh, the Tennessee state, however, in this case, this, this only went to the Supreme Court of the state of Tennessee. And it upheld that state law, which, and that law prohibited school teachers to teach any theory that denies the story of divine creation of man as taught in the Bible, or to teach instead that man has descended from lower, a lower order of animals. Uh, and later, in Epperson versus Arkansas, uh, this was a high school uh, instructor, a biology teacher, and this went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said uh, that the state of Arkansas uh, cannot require uh, that teaching and learning must be tailored to the principles or prohibitions of any religion or dogma. Now I'm going to just give you a, a short little uh, addition to this. Uh, who are these opponents of the theory of evolution? Uh, the first group are called Young Earth Creationism. Is uh, they accept literal accounts of creation out of the Bible taking place over six hours. And in the other group of those who are opponents uh, believe in intellectual design. Uh, they accept geologic dating of the earth and agree that evidence supports microevolution. However, they believe it is scientifically impossible for living change as they now exist to have evolved by chance uh, through large numbers of random um, mutations. In uh, 1971, uh, this was finally, it took that long for the Supreme Court to set down uh, a test by where uh, they could more, other courts could more easily uh, evaluate whether uh, state laws uh, or the Congress uh, were violating um, or even the president, if he makes an executive order, uh, are violating uh, the establishment of free exercise clauses. And they wrote it as such. Government violates the establishment clause unless the action, and that means the law or whatever, act, it could be a behavior, but it's primarily a law, the action shows a non-secular purpose. So if the law shows a non-secular purpose, it's fine. The action does not have the primary effect of advancing or inhibiting religion. That is OK. And the action, the law again, does not foster excesses, excessive entanglement between government and religion. 
We have Roe versus Wade in 1973. The Texas state law prohibited abortion. At that time, and if you read the ruling and you read previous to that ruling, and uh, especially uh, what Justice Blackman and the other justices, the kind of, uh, and their clerks, the kind of research that they conducted relevant to this case, almost all of the state legislators with the governor who enacted this law uh, were uh, very conservative Christians, either Protestant or Catholic. And this is just one part of the ruling that I drew, pulled out for you to see how complicated it was for Justice Blackman and the others to evaluate all this information. But then, anyway, they had to come, they felt they had to come to this conclusion. In reviewing past and present theological and medical assumptions of when life begins, in view of all this, we do not agree that by adopting one theory of life, because it was all about the theory of when life begins, looking at medical evidence, looking at historical evidence from philosophers, etc., all along the line. They said, by adopting one theory of life that this state legislature had adopted, because of its religious beliefs. Texas may override the rights of the pregnant woman that are at stake, all right? Lawrence versus Texas, this is a state law in Texas in 2003. Uh, with this ruling, it actually gave a lot of incentive to the gay and lesbian uh, movement uh, because the state law of Texas was uh, called ruled as unconstitutional uh, by the Supreme Court. It prohibited sodomy, sodomy activities between, only between homosexuals. Kennedy wrote the decision. He said the court held that laws against sodomy that are directed to one group violate the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. Further, he noted, the liberty, that is that freedom in the First Amendment. The liberty protected by the Constitution allows homosexual persons the right, also a privacy right, uh, to choose to enter upon relationships in the confines of their homes and their own private lives and still retain their dignity as free persons. Gonzalez versus Carhart, uh, this was just last year, uh, there were two cases connected together, relevant uh, to the partial, the Federal Partial Birth Abortion Act uh, by Congress in 2003. Uh, the court um, uh, did the the law lacked totally uh, any language uh, protecting the mother in case she were too year ill to carry uh, the fetus to fruition. Uh, and uh, that was the reason uh, um, uh, Gonzalez, uh, 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 that is Carhartt, in both cases uh, went up against uh, this law. Justice Kennedy pointed out uh, that the act did not impose undue burden on a mother's right to abortion based on its lack of a health exception. Kennedy wrote further that the act defines the fetus in the womb this law defines the fetus in the womb as a living organism. It prohibits the killing of a living fetus if a doctor kills the partially delivered living fetus, uh, which Kennedy further added expresses respect for the dignity of human life. Now, um, this is a very, uh, you, can, you can tell, uh, a very personal value in his writing uh, on his feelings about this uh, issue of a living uh, hu human being. And of course, this is part of this conflict. This is all connected to religious values. Um, uh, and of course, this was a very controversial case. And this one from Hein versus Friedman, uh, this is the 
executive order uh, that the president wrote the first week he became president of the United States in 2001, in January 2001. Um, it called it the White House Office of Faith-Based and Community Initiative. Um, the Supreme Court said the law does not violate the Constitution's Establishment Clause between separation of church and state. However, this law allows the White House to conduct and finance church events, training, financially supports religious social organizations, and gives financial aid to numerous religious conferences, training and grant giving, and aid to various so church social, social support systems. Further, uh, Justice uh, Alito reversed judgment from lower courts uh, that, and that was actually back in 1968, Flast versus Cohen, because the point here, the point here was the argument in this case. You're using the president and his office of faith-based community are using tax dollars to allocate all of these privileges. Uh, and in Flax versus Cohen, going back to Article 1, Paragraph 8 of the Constitution, the people can protest if Congress is using monies that are objective and are violating their, their um, uh, uh, the appropriate allocation of funding, and that even became stronger once the Constitution, the Bill of Rights was added, the First Amendment right was added, incorporating uh, the Establishment and Free Exercise Clause. But uh, Justice Alito uh, denied any evidence that taxpayer uh, monies are being used for religious purposes because his argument in his writing, his ruling was, Congress allocates the money to the president. If the president then turns around and allocates it the way he wants to, it's not Congress's fault. And and um, and other and besides, he did not see it. He would not accept uh, the. Flast versus Cohen argument. So it's quite fascinating. And there are, I have a couple more uh, here to show, uh, not with religious, with, to do with religion, but to do with uh, the um, new court, uh, the new Supreme Court, the way it is united, the five conservatives uh, that are so called the conservatives. Uh, how they have made so many rulings in the past, these past two years specifically, not only uh, supporting uh, church and state uh, closeness or religious values to be um, uh, okay in, in government, but they are also, uh, in many of their rulings, have shown that they um, favor in the in the ruling industry over um, the employees and in this case a woman uh, protested and sued from all the way through the federal court system up to the Supreme Court that she had been uh, discriminated against in salary <coughs> and the, the, uh, the Supreme Court did not see it that way also in death penalty cases in the last two years 14 out of 18 non-Texas cases, all uh, the death penalty prevailed. Uh, and a very recent case, Bayes versus Rees, uh, April 14, 2008, the court upheld execution by lethal injection as perfectly all right in the state of Kentucky. And this week, uh, the state of Georgia conducted a uh, lethal injection execution. And and, and analysts suggest one third of the court's decision in these last, in especially the last year and a half, more than any in recent term, 
were decided five to four along ideological values, all right, their philosophies, all right, not only their history uh, in, in law, but their, also their philosophies uh, and what they, how they <coughs> see government and religion and state and all the and industry and all of these other things, how they see that. Now, the nine justices, and they are so important to all of this, uh, I'd like to introduce them to all of you. And we have, this is Justice uh, John Roberts. He's the Chief Justice of the, cons of the Court. He was uh, nominated and confirmed uh, in 2005, and uh, nominated by President uh, George W. Bush. We have Justice Antonin uh, Scalia. He was uh, nominated by President Reagan in 1986. He is one of the originalists, and along with uh, Thomas, who you'll see in a second. Uh, this is uh, Samuel Anthony uh, Alito, Jr. And he was nominated by President George W. Bush in 2006. Clarence Thomas by President George Herbert Walker Bush in 1991. And then you have uh, Anthony uh, Kennedy, who was nominated by President Reagan in 1988. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, she was nominated by President Clinton in 1993. John Paul Stevens, nominated by Gerald Ford, President Gerald Ford in 1975. David Hackett Sauter, 1990, uh, by President Herbert Walker Bush. <coughs> and then lastly, we have Justice Stephen Breyer in 1994 by President Clinton. Here I want to give you a little bit of their composite, their characteristics. Of course you know eight are male, one, uh, seven white, one black, and one female white, educated at the best universities. Five of the justices are considered conservative, and all five of the conservative justices are Catholic. Uh, Chief Justice John Roberts, Justice Antonin Scalia, Justice Clarence Thomas, uh, Justice uh, Anthony uh, Kennedy, and Sa Justice Samuel Anthony Alito. Four of the justices are considered as moderate with following religious affiliations. Uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, is Jewish. Uh, Justice Stephen G. Breyer is also Jewish. Uh, Justice David Hackett Sauter is Protestant. They did not give which affiliation. And Justice John Paul Stevens, Protestant. All right. And now we're going to look at some of these interest groups who are very much in conflict uh, with the idea of separation of church and state. And also, um, as I was researching, uh, have a common a commonality among them uh, because of their view of the immorality that is arising uh, in the United States as well as the world, but especially in the United States. First off, uh, William Simon, uh, he was he was a uh, Republican, a very wealthy Catholic who was former Secretary of Treasury under President Nixon. He became a very important uh, spokesperson and creator of how Republicans, after the Nixon uh, scandal, how they could regenerate their image and how they could gain um, entrance back into public policy making. Uh, he was the creator of the what they call the Simon Plan to remoralize America. Uh, he wrote, we must generate a new conservative message and focus on traditionalist pre-Vatican II Catholic moral issues. 
Uh, he was not shy at any of his speeches, at any of his um, conferences, to say there is no separating my faith from my politics. Uh, Simon defined further, our business world friends have to destroy, and this is all documented, have to destroy liberal causes such as Social Security, Medicare, ideas on universal health care, and go after liberal institutions such as universities, unions, main street religions, and the media. Uh, we must secure, according to Simon, advocates in political, economic, educational, and media positions. His unified message said, uh, the message that we as Republicans present to the public has to be centrist on any given issue. It descends intact from there to the think tank. The think tank are uh, experts in an institution, uh, or they develop, they create an institution and call it themselves think a think tank. Uh, and they they define, uh, they an an analyze issues and they make, uh, they suggest solutions. Uh, and then with those solutions, these are talking points to the pundits. Those are the individuals the pundits are on in the media, and who put the message into a daily discourse. Then that message is given, however, directly to the political candidate. Additional advocates of the conservative right, the gobblers, uh, they were very interesting. They um, both recently died. Uh, they founded the Educational Research Analyst Conservative Christian Organization out of Texas. For five decades, they reformed how textbooks uh, would reflect their conservative values. Um, uh, they, ha they had such a, uh, a power of influence in all of the publishing, um, textbook publishing school um, uh, corporations across the country and even internationally, but especially in this country. Very focused on kindergarten through high school. However, also in college and university textbooks. Their message, uh, their reforms, some of the reforms were that school books should present a universe that rewards virtue versus uh, um, punish, uh, and does not punish, uh, the, uh, pardon me, uh, a universe that rewards virtue and punishes vice. Good and evil are not moral equivalents. Christian views on current controversial issues such as global warming, feminism, evolution, and sensitive uh, treatment of benefits, the two, two parent families should be represented. High school uh, world history text should prevent stereotypes of whites as oppressors and people of color as victims. Leo Strauss uh, has been connected to the neocons. If anyone has heard the concept or the word neocon, meaning uh, the new Republican conservatives very much to the right, they are very much connected to President Bush, and they have a, a certain philosophy. Well, they, it is uh, suggested uh, that they are inspired by the, his political philosophies, uh, his philosophical ideas, um, when he was uh, teaching for many years uh, as a theorist of political science at the University of Chicago. He was extremely famous, wrote many books, uh, came from Germany, a Jew who uh, escaped uh, from the Holocaust. And uh, he had a very different, a definite, uh, he theorized, uh, you know, some people say, uh, you, you'll, you know, if you read a, a much more about uh, this, uh, that he is the reason, um, uh, you know, our president with his neocons like Rumsfeld and Cheney uh, invaded Iraq, and, there, and uh, you know, it was because of, of uh, Leo Strauss. Well, I think that's really bringing it a bit too far because he theorized. And I'm sure he didn't say at that time, you, in the next future, when you go out there and are in government, you should be doing such radical things. 
However, he had very specific ideas because he very much followed Plato, Aristotle, and Hobbes uh, in their thinking. Uh, he believed modernity and liberal ideas of democracy, which he called nihilism, are the cause for the immoral hedonism existent in America and the world today. He wrote this many, many times. He said there should be an authority who needs to, is, uh, to be established. Uh, this, this authority, he, would, would, he wrote, could be a government, it could be <laughs> a monarch, it could be a president. Uh, he has to be a wise tyrant who can and should use noble lies. Uh, especially, and of course he's, he's reiterating ideas out of philosophers like Plato and, and Aristotle. Uh, noble idea, nobleize, that this, this uh, authority uh, should lie if it's necessary. You keep secrets uh, from your society uh, if necessary. Um, uh, to, because you, your purpose, you, this authority, is to enforce change in political and social behavior that is so immoral according to his I, I, uh, ideas. Uh, and an American control and dominance of the world is the important, uh, is most important for this authority uh, to be successful. So if you do <coughs> read uh, uh, writings, uh, for example, like William Crystal or uh, others that are connected to the project for a new American century, who were uh, William Crystal's father and mother uh, got their PhDs under um, uh, Strauss. Uh, so did uh, Paul Wolfowitz. In fact, I, there you can see, these are just some of the people. Uh, he had so many students that are actually today in our government or in the media uh, or in industry all over the country. And the neocons also followed the Simon plan. The Reconstructionist, this is another advocate, uh, John Rushduni, a Calvinist, uh, and he founded the Chalcedon Foundation in 1965. Uh, Rushduni believed that American society must be infiltrated with conservative Christian values. This is all documented in his papers and in the books that he has written. Uh, he said we have to ensure a church authority similar to the Middle Ages in which the state with church would be ruled by elitists to secure morality, control, and economic strength. Rushdani stated wealth is a religious value and he noted that out of the Old Testament, Deuteronomy um, 28, chapter 30, verses 19 and 20, and it is a reward from God for goodness. He urged his followers to secure advocates into political, economic, education, and media positions to um, expand his philosophy, this kind of um, philosophy. Uh, and these are just some of his uh, followers. Uh, Pat Robertson, uh, who had created the Christian Coalition, and, the Christ, and also uh, Regent University, from which 150 uh, students out of its uh, graduate schools of law, uh, in, uh, including Monica Goodling, if you might remember with the Gonzalez issue a year ago, uh, are all present in the uh, administration of pre uh, uh, President Bush. Um, and it, even um, uh, also uh, additional Followers are uh, Gary Bauer, Jerry Wal Falwell, who created the majority, moral majority. He also, his Liberty University, from which Mike Huckabee uh, got his master's degree. Uh, to understand the Catholic society, now this is the Catholic part of this Christian right uh, movement uh, or interest groups, uh, Opus Dei. Uh, to understand Opus Dei, one must first understand uh, the fundamental origin from where Opus Dei derived, and that is Carlism. Carlism was a movement. In 1833 to 1839, a Spanish group of militant, ultra-Orthodox Catholics who wanted to reestablish the Bourbon monarchy with close ties to the church and state. Because the president, at that time, the monarch that was in place, 
actually was starting to have a separation of church and state. All right, he wanted to be autonomous. Well, they didn't want that, and there was a terrible uh, civil war that went on. Um, later, the Carlists were strong supporters. That is, by the end of the 19th century, uh, I mean, that Carlism continued. They were strong supporters of the Franco regime, and Franco be was the dictator, and even into the 20th century, uh, Franco um, won his civil war and was the dictator there from 1936 to 1978. This is the founder of Opus Dei, Jose Maria Escrevilla de Berjam. He was a Carlist and a priest, and he founded a Catholic society in 1928. By 1934, he had already documented in his book, The Way, all the rules for the members of the society. These are principles of Opus Dei. Catholics could achieve holiness through everyday work, prayer, unquestioned adherence to Catholic teachings on all social issues. This is, you can go into his book and you can find, there are hundreds and hundreds of rules that are in his book, the way. Uh, adherence to Catholic teachings on all social issues, no religious dissent, and to further Catholic evangelicalism. We have to bring all society under the pre-Vatican II period of Catholic dogma, dogma, meaning to a very, very conservative um, presentation of Catholic principles that had, at that time, were very connected. The church and state were very connected. Opus Dei focuses, uh, uh, very interestingly, on wealth and reverence for economic power. In fact, uh, you could, from all of the writings and, and literature and sources that I have looked up, uh, um, the members, which are 80,000 around the world, here in the United States, not even quite 4,000, but they are wealthy people and from very wealthy families. The structure of uh, Opus Dei has a prelature, they call it the prelature, which is, it is a world diocese, totally independent. It's not like connected to any uh, particular diocese here in the church in uh, our state or in any country. It is totally worldwide. Uh, then there's the prelate, who is the authority of that, and, and as you saw, uh, Jose Maria Estevara, he was the prelate until he died in the uh, late 90s, and he was already canonized in 2002. Uh, the second in order of the structure are the numeraries. These are single members, they are celibate, and they actually live only in centers that are <coughs> Opus Dei centers, and um, have certain uh, procedures that they have to follow each day. Uh, under them are the supernumeraries. These are married members uh, who have their own families and are very you know, involved in all of society. And then cooperators, who are not actual members, but they are very supportive of this uh, society and its principles. The society is only answerable to the Pope, to the Pope not to any bishop, not to any cardinal, nowhere just to the Pope, so that is quite amazing. And it is very, very supported by the previous Pope that just died and also Pope Pius um, uh, Benedict uh, the 16th. Some support of non-members, you can see right here. Okay, thank you. Some support members, I don't know if anyone is familiar uh, with the name of Judge Robert Bork. Um, George Weigel, uh, Senator Sam Brownback, uh, Lawrence Kudlow, he is a very important financial uh, commentator, uh, uh, Supreme Court Justice Thomas, um, the former Senator Santorin of Pennsylvania, S Supreme Justice Scalia, in fact Scalia, they also have priests, they have their own priests, they are Holy Cross priests, 
uh, and there are 1,800 of them. And uh, the, the former, uh, no, these are, these are non-members, these are these cooperators. Uh, the former U.S. Solicitor General Ted Olson, who uh, won Bush versus Gore in 2000, uh, William Donahue, uh, and a Reverend John McCloskey, uh, who is extremely important. He's in all the think tanks of, um, he's an open state priest, he's in all the think tanks in Washington. He's very, very connected. And they, these supporters, and also these members, are very uh, connected to the Simon Plan and the neocon uh, strategy. Some, not all of them, but most of them. Now, the common threads that brought the Christian right and the neocons to support George Walker Bush. Because if you see, there are, there are objectives from the, the other groups that we have seen, the interest groups. And now let's look at what George uh, W. Bush, how he wrote down, he has written down the objections that he had, would he be president? Of course, he was born in Connecticut in 1946. His father, George Herbert Walker Bush, uh, has an amazing background. Uh, the common threads? Well, Bush uh, stated during his 2000 presidential campaign that during the late 1980s, he received a, revolution, a, re a revelation excuse me, from God. Uh, he wrote uh, in a book and also in papers that he has that are documented. Um, uh, that he believes in the following. I have a strong Christian faith. I believe in the life of an unborn child. Uh, a president must be able to make strong decisions. I believe those who face the death penalty should receive their punishment to deter others. Uh, when he was pre uh, governor of, of the state of Texas, uh, the amount of death penalties uh, went up enormously. There is an unprecedented decay in our American culture a decay that has eroded the foundations of our collective values and moral standards. And he believed, he wrote, it is important for an authority to ensure reestablishment of Christian morals, standards of conduct, and slow down modern ideas of hedonism. He has close ties uh, to and allocations of values of government. Wait a minute, this, is, uh, this is important because he, when he was elected, then he uh, showed the United States and through his through his um, uh, suggesting laws and through his um, speeches uh, that he has close ties and allocation of values for government support to religious facilities and associations. We talked about that uh, court um, um, ruling a few moments ago. Uh, very close ties to the wealthy and industry especially the oil and weaponry industry. Uh, all of this is documented through his executive orders and laws he has lobbied for and signed into law. These are the accomplishments and I'm all done. Uh, just sort of putting down, because in the beginning I asked, well, have they really accomplished their goals in trying to have closer ties of church and state and, and changing? Uh, well, there has been a joining of Christian and conservative strategic messages um, that have been successfully infiltrated through churches, universities. I'm, we're talking public. We're not talking private. We're talking public. Also, all areas of government, industry, and the public media by their advocates. Uh, this political machine I call a uh, very common concept in, in political science uh, when interest groups get together and they have so much power and actually get results from the kind of power they have by getting policy made. They have been productive in creating closer ties between church and state and protecting their followers and constituents through supporting and successfully seeing to it that a very conservative president was elected in 2004 and 2008, uh, uh, pardon me, 2000, 2004, uh, uh, who was, is, has actually evolved as this authority, leading elites who share the same values to ensure enactment of laws which have happened that reflect morality and control over social, economic, and world values 
now heads of the United States. Uh, by supporting nominations, these groups have supported nominations, and they have received confirma confirmations from the Senate for very conservative new justices added to the Supreme Court to further their goals. Uh, a further accomplishment, they have uh, they received uh, favorable cor court decisions, which I've spoken about just a few. Um, these rulings have very much favored uh, religious values. They have favored industry versus employees. And they have such a su substantial infiltration into government that there is such a, a very strong support in government of religious practices in public institutions, and at last they are standing behind laws that defy the purpose and meaning of the establishment and free ex exercise clauses. Uh, they're advocates uh, making their religious message an important part of discourse in all areas, showing, slowing down uh, what um, Strauss called modernity what Strauss called too much democracy, uh, slowing down individual freedoms with a pursuit to limit modern beliefs to become part of a political uh, discourse. Now this resulted in, and I promise you this is my last slide, not all individuals are happy about the ties achieved between the church and state accomplishments by this combined conservative interest group effort. And we're talking the Protestant, Catholic, neocons with uh, uh, President Bush and his associates. And because democ democratic processes still exist in America, this political conflict, this political discourse uh, will continue over the issue of separation of church and state. It's by no means uh, resolved. Thank you so much for being so patient. Do you see uh, any of the uh, upcoming candidates, McCain or possibly Clinton or Obama, and I'm thinking maybe uh, McCain or Clinton, as uh, being uh, co-opted by this uh, neocon movement, or now the neocons are getting a slightly bad name, but, but this same, do you think that they're no. trying to pull in any of these candidates to continue these purposes, or will it end when George Bush's term ends? Well, uh, you know what's very interesting you're asking that because uh, CNN and uh, even MSNBC have had um, um, open forums on religion, and they have invited these individuals. Uh, at first, it was all of the candidates on both sides, and now they have uh, they invited. Uh, uh, from the Democratic side uh, only, uh, they invited um, Clinton and Obama. Uh, so uh, both of them wanted to show very much how religious, uh, their, how much they believe in religion and how closely tied they are to the religion. Uh, I, I, now, I don't believe at all that they would be connected to any of the neocons, but uh, from what um, the statements that, especially in these uh, forums that I saw, uh, uh, what Hillary Clinton said relevant to her religion, uh, and, and you know, um, it is quite amazing what politicians will do uh, to get elected to office, uh, that uh, mm, as hard as it is to believe, they, they do make deals with their interest groups. So I am the last one to say, no, it's not going to happen. And oh, it's going to stop as soon as uh, either Hillary uh, Clinton or Barack Obama or uh, McCain gets in, uh, whichever one of these three uh, is really elected in office. However, uh, it's, very, it's all about politics. Uh, they're pushing uh, and supporting these groups, even though they are 
actually religious. They are all, each three, all three of them are actually connected to a particular religion. All right, she's a Methodist, has always been a Methodist. Uh, Barack Obama is a Christian since for 20 years now. And um, McCain, uh, if I'm not mistaken, was a Methodist and became a Baptist a couple of years ago. So, I, you know, to give you a final answer on that one, it's not clear that it will end. Uh, what end? What do you mean end? That well, no more pushing religion into uh, public you've policy? You've suggested more than that. You've suggested that there is a, a spearheading of uh, these, right. this particular Straussian right. um, oh. and noble lie idea and this ah. notion of wealth. Well, that is a very neocon. Well, now, uh, well, uh, let me ask. May I ask you a question? Uh, and any of you, uh, looking at the candidates, who of the three candidates acts as if they would be such an authority? Well, I, my brother lives in Texas and, and you know, come, talks to a lot of people. He said, Hillary Clinton is continuing on. He, she's the one they want. And she's the candidate, even though she's a Democrat, she would be the one to, uh, Present herself as a centrist, she, but really she presents continue, herself as a hawk. Continue mm -hmm. on their program. That's, that's well, yeah, uh, because why? Uh, in, in particular, with Hillary Clinton, she has very close ties. Her large, some of her largest groups are the uh, Jewish uh, constituencies, and they have a, an extreme interest in seeing that uh, in the Middle East, uh, the middle, the Arab uh, countries are uh, kept in order and kept in place. Uh, and they're not interested in having big negotiations. And she has presented herself, I mean, did anyone here a couple weeks ago, or who was last week, last week or two weeks ago, she was interviewed on um, uh, Mor uh, Morning America on a ABC um, by Diana, with, I can't think of her last name, but she was asked the question, what would you do if um, Israel was attacked by Iran? And he, she said, in a second, she said, I would obliterate them. What, and that is a hawk. Or that is someone who is trying to let them know, I'm going to obliterate you. All right, now what does that mean? That could mean I'm going to nuke you, or I'm going to blow up everything and kill many innocent people who have nothing to do with any of these decisions. What does that mean? Uh, you've never heard that. And then you, uh, that same question uh, was asked by Tim Russert to uh, Barack Obama last Sunday. And he said, well, uh, you know, especially right now with the time that we're going through, uh, to make such suggestions without, first of all, having discussions <laughs> with the com com countries between each other, uh, is uh, I can't even give you an answer like that. But to say to obliterate, he thought that was, you know, he said it's political. It was a political move. But McCain has also made certain commentations that are very similar. Okay. So what they what what they are trying to do in this case now this is the neocon issue, the neocon mentality of the Stroysians, uh, is. Uh, Control, control over the Middle East because the Middle East is so important. It's not only important for Israel; it's important for us. Why? Right. Okay. Oil, oil, big time oil. Okay. So it is so complex, but I can't give you the final answer on it. Uh, I, 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 I can just observe all of these individuals, which I do all the time. Now, but your question is really well taken. I wanted to get your thoughts about. Um, did Tocqueville's view on all of this, right? Which oh, is yes, say, well, that is, yes, uh-huh. Which is to say well, that, I mean, because the United yeah. States is so unusual in the world oh, in yeah. terms of the, va the values that we hold in this country, mm -hmm. being, being a rich, wealthy, industrial country and being as religious as we are is very unusual in the world. Yes, it is. And unique. And he wrote about that. And, and right, Tocqueville says that this is partly 
he looks at it as the separation between church and state is good for the churches because it provides the churches with a fair amount of independence. Well, absolutely. That was the idea, too. That's right. And, right. The, and, the, and the government also uh, benefits from a religion that is independent, religious institutions that are independent. Right, that's a very good point. So I just wanted to see what you thought about that. In well, the context I think, of all of this, because yeah, if that's true, your, your the, point more, is, the farther they go down this yeah. road, mm -hmm. the more that's the churches are going to become weak. Well, I mean, that was also in the discussion. Uh, your, uh, your point is so so good. Uh, in the discussions of writing the, the First Amendment, the, free, uh, the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise, it, was also, it wasn't just uh, to keep that separation uh, because they were so worried Although they had a bad history already of state nominations, uh, church denominations, but it was also a terrible financial obligation if you're going to be connected and be support supportive. It's all was it also a financial thing too. So back to your point, yeah. So yeah, and and this is this is uh, uh, this is what uh, Detroit was trying to, to develop, was trying to bring out too the benefit. To the government, not only and to the churches, right? Yeah, but um, you know, it is an argument, and when we think about it, and like you said, uh, when we think about it, our our country has been so infiltrated in all areas, public or not, uh, with religion. All right, and it has it has been for those once this First Amendment was actually, you know, I don't think anybody really took it seriously because they were, really thought it was just, it only applied to the Congress, you know, and they knew how weak the Congress was acting in many things. States were making all kinds of laws violating Congress's laws, okay? We saw that right after the Civil War. Not until the middle of the 20th century with rulings like Cantwell and Epperson and then one after another that it became very offensive uh, to those who felt religion needed to stay in public schools, at least some form of it, being allowed to pray in class, uh, even a cross, even the Ten Commandments, whatever that would be representative and something that they felt they could connect to. <coughs> all right? They felt then violated. And that's where, okay, over time, we see some rulings against their desire of connect, a continued connection. Uh, but in the last years, especially the last two years now, we're seeing just the reversal from our Supreme Court, these very uh, uh, conservative justices, yes. All right, so our US Constitution is essentially an embodiment of Enlightenment era values. Would you say, with that said, would you say that this larger neocon movement, would you see that as a devolution in our modern day society? A uh, devolution from, from government to what? Devolution, when you're saying a devolution, well, you're saying from, you're taking something from, away from, from something. Yeah, from the, from the liberal, I guess, advancements that we made during the alignment. Well, uh, well, it's yeah. It's like a conservative side base. Yeah, uh, especially with the connection of the uh, Bill of Rights. Not the original Constitution, but the connection of the Bill yeah. of Rights. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's what Strauss was talking about. Strauss was said because of these, you know, and not only those. But actually, those, Strauss's return to conservative values is, wouldn't you kind of regard that as a, a taking a step back? Well, uh, maybe you might, or I might, okay. but not, they, they don't think so. Oh, well, of course not. No. All right. So they are saying there has to be a correction. Because there, this modernity, this too broadness, this this increasing of democratic um, liberties that are happening, not only through the Bill of Rights and the rest of the uh, amendments uh, that have been added to the Constitution, but also the civil rights laws of the 60s, Roe versus Wade. All those are the uh, the additional. <coughs> Uh, laws that they felt extremely violated by um, with their values, their religious values. How could government make a law that, that 
uh, first of all, sees blacks have the same value as a white because it is, um, and I can tell you this from history, uh, and I, I can't speak for it this moment, but, but I was raised a Catholic. And in my Catholic education, I heard it many times about the, the gift of being white. The gift of being white. I don't know if they said that in all Catholic <coughs> schools, in all Catholic uh, uh, private schools, but it has been known that in, in different, different religions can be very racist. So this is something I bring out in my paper, not calling them racist. I just looked at the, at the evidence of what, what steps many took in these different religions once these laws were enacted. And what they did, they left the Democratic Party in the 70s, especially after Roe versus Wade, and especially in all the southern, southern west, uh, west uh, east, and southern states, through Texas, left the Democratic Party and became Republicans. Because they felt the Republican Party had you know, carried their values on religion and religious values uh, more than the Democrats. Well, so would you say that imposing those so, values are is a, essentially a step back? Uh, I personally, if you're asking for my personal opinion, yes. yes. If you're asking as uh, me as a political scientist, uh, I think uh, I would have to answer what we would have to leave that to the discourse. Um, and the democratic process to see if that's true, okay? And what I mean by that is we have a democratic process of electing representatives, of, of having the freedom of having interest groups. We have all of these many different democratic processes, uh, state and national, protect us to continue in a modern direction. But if those who believe that way to continue this modern evolvement of democracy in our country don't go and vote, then who, uh, who may vote and deny, or maybe you, if you feel that should continue, uh, or someone else or I feel that the democratic process uh, that democratic involvement that Strauss didn't like. Uh, if you don't go and vote, and you believe it should continue, but those vote heavily who don't like that democratic involvement to, to broaden itself, then it, it violates their beliefs. Okay? Mm -hmm. So that's, that is, uh, seeing it from my eyes as a political scientist, um, the society is going to have to decide through the democratic process of, elect, of electing, of, 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 of promoting and pushing its ideas to, and getting public officials in that agree with them. It just depends on, here we have, we have another conflict, okay? And the conflict is what you're saying up against what somebody else is saying. All right, or believe. And it all depends on who goes and votes. And that has been happening again and again and again when many people, young or old or whomever, do not actually vote to try to continue this democratic process. Okay? And it's another thing that's so important is understanding the political philosophies of each of our, our parties. That is really important. So, come to my class. I'm happy to teach you. Yes. Yes. Um, just a, uh, an admonition, perhaps. Uh, we have been raised in an era of the liberal courts. Uh, the court may, in fact, be reverting to something that has been the very nature of our country from the beginning. Right. Uh, John Marshall was a conservative. Right. Uh, uh, we had a conservative court from... Mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, Lincoln through FDR, he only had two Democrats in the White House for 72 years. So it may well be that starting with Brown versus Board of Education and going up through the Warren Court, this is an aberration and we are essentially a very conservative country. Europe is fascinated by our um, devotion to religion and our basic conservatism. And we are just simply returning to our roots. Mm -hmm. uh, Cass Sunstein has a book called Radicals and Robes, yes. in which he talks about originalism versus fundamentalism That's and how these things are coming back into right. play. And it may be these are not atypical. Mm -hmm. These are our DNA strands that we right. are returning to. And the Warren Court was, in fact, the time when we were out of step. Although those of us who have been reared in your generation and mine think that this is the way things ought to be because we find that ought in our constitutional readings. Right. But nevertheless, the real ought is protection of property, protection of corporations, protection of whites, right. maintenance of religion. All of this stuff is our basic grunt norm, to use Tilson's term, uh, which we are now returning to in the Rehnquist in the Roberts Court. So I'm just throwing that out as an option. No, I, and I'm glad you brought that up, David, uh, because you brought the, uh, the concepts of originalists uh, versus uh, the ad, uh, advocacies. Um, we have, we, I told you when I showed you the pictures of the different um, uh, justices, I brought out the point that Scalia is an originalist. Well, he's not the only orig originalist, uh, so is Thomas. Uh, uh, part, you know, Thomas, absolutely, but so is Roberts, so is Alito, and Kennedy pretty much. Now, let me explain what an originalist is. They interpret the, any laws that come up to them, they want to interpret whether those laws are conflicting to the original base constitution of 1787, not any of the additions of ad, ad, uh, amendments to it. Those are originalists. And that is what David was talking about. And that is the way Scalia sees it. That's the way Thomas always sees it. And very much from the rulings that I have just shown you and some that have happened in the last few weeks, that's the way the other conservatives also see it. Now, the modern or activists on the court or on any court <coughs> when they look at laws or behavior or whatever let's say our governor or uh, our president uh, some kind of uh, executive order uh, is they feel is violating the constitution then those mo those activists they look at the co base constitution of 1787 plus all of the 27 amendments to it and then they and they see what that law, what law, if it's violating any one of those amendments, or and in, including base constitution. So this is a, a, the, the the issue. And most of our history in the 20, 225 years, we've had originalists on the court. And it actually, as David brought out, it was with Brown versus the Board of Education. And uh, who, who was the Chief Justice of that court? Earl Warren, a Republican from California, right? Nominated by... Helped incarcerate the Japanese. I know it. I know it. How we change. Uh -huh. I know it. I know it. Yes, yes. Would you say that Strauss rejects the concept in uh, Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal. Oh, definitely. I mean, you know, it's not possible because did Aristotle or did uh, they didn't they didn't believe that people were equal. You were born into a, a level, and then there were leads and there were others. No. Oh yeah. No, he did no. That's well, he talks about an authority. And he talks about elites. Okay, so he did not believe that everyone is equal. Now, throughout almost all of human history, mm -hmm. the few ruled over the many. Yes. And the right. church, religion, 
legitimated the right of the few to rule yes. the many. Mm -hmm. We saw with the ideals of the Enlightenment a departure uh, from that. And then in the past 500 years with the discovery of the quote unquote new world, yeah. an opportunity to break away from the confinement limitations of the old world where there was no new land available. Right, right, and to right. put enlightenment philosophy right. into practice with the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. But now wealth is becoming increasingly concentrated again in this country mm -hmm. and the few are reemerging. Right. Is it surprising, do you think, that uh, religion is reemerging uh, to legitimate the attempted domination of the few over the many again, or, or not? No, because just looking at the groups, the interest groups that I pointed out, they are so very, all, everyone supports wealth, and they see wealth as a reward, even the, the Opus Dei, they see wealth as a reward for your holiness, your goodness. Oh, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Back to the future. And, and um, President Bush also reads out of the same Bible as Bush Dooney read out of, uh, or re read out of, he's no longer alive, or that Pat Robertson reads out of, or Jerry Falwell read out of, he died last year or many of Gary Bauer and all of the, of the um, <coughs> uh, leaders in, of the Christian right movement. So, and it, they believe wealth is important. It is a reflection of success, of goodness. And therefore, also, only those that have the most wealth should be the ones that are decision makers. They should encompass this authority. Yes. So Angela, if there's no fun of fundamentalism, there's too much sin in the synagogue. There's no what? No fun of fundamentalism, and there's too much sin in the synagogue, and you're, and you're pissed off as an Episcopalian. Where, where do we go? I no. I, everybody here should know I worship paper bags. Everybody aware of that? I'm sacrilegious. Serious question. Um, you didn't comment on the case. I think was it the Denver? Was it the Denver? Was it the Dover, Pennsylvania Board of Education case? The Board of Education, which was a, cons a fairly conservative and religious board, had uh, tried to introduce uh, intelligent design as a counterpoint uh, to um, essentially to uh, the concept of natural selection and Darwinism. Right. The case eventually went to the court system. Now, I'm not sure whether it was in the state court system. My assumption is it was. No, uh, you're talking about it, it, is, uh, it was about evolution. Uh, so well, it would be in the state court, court system first. I believe it was. Oh, yeah, because the state would have, like uh, Colorado apparently has, has a law. I heard, yes. heard weekly the name, yeah. but I'm not factually well informed. There's a, there's a NOVA episode where they take oh. that case step by step. It's excellent. If mm -hmm. you ever get a hold of it, I, I want to show it to my students because mm -hmm. it's the most fascinating okay, yeah. court case because they actually found the, the, the uh, lawyers, the law team uh, defending the evolution side, actually found, the, 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 they got down to where the textbook for intelligent design, they're trying to say, no, this isn't creationism. This is something new. Mm -hmm. This is intelligent design. Mm -hmm. It's scientific. Mm -hmm. And so there was this debate between mm -hmm. actually a couple, one philosopher on the side of intelligent design trying to defend it as a scientific theory. But there's, they actually found a smoking gun in older versions of the textbook where they actually saw the word create and then there was an erasure. So they saw that they actually just went through a textbook uh -huh. and, uh -huh. and just deleted creationism and put in manually, copy and paste, the words intelligent design. Uh -huh. So it was an open and shut case once they found that smoking gun that in mm -hmm. fact creationism was being promoted in religion, not this oh, new yeah. scientific yeah. theory. Oh, and it was a ruse. But I mean, that, a, that I'm well aware of. Yeah, they, so they, they tried to interconnect and try yeah. to but there's one time where the courts actually ruled in favor of um, the liberal democratic separation between church and state. 
Well, ever, uh, that, was your, that was judged by a, a judge. It wasn't a jury. It was, it was a judge. judge. Yeah, I forgot his name. Uh, I forget. Name too. Yeah, I really appreciate. Well, what, yeah, it just let me just finish. But the thing that w went a step further that was so fascinating by this entire case yeah. was the attempt to make it's, it's fine as faith, but to try to equate essentially intelligent design, and at the core of that, the concept of irreducible complexity. It was utterly destroyed, utterly destroyed essentially through the testimony that was given in this case, right. saying if you're going to teach it, that's fine, but teach it for what it is. It is still religion. It is not right. science. Right, right. So that was... Yeah, well, they don't believe in the random uh, selection or the, the uh, evolution of random uh, selection. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that is their bottom line. Mm -hmm. you know? They say they're scientific, but then when it comes to this, they don't believe in that. So they actually are creationists. They are actually part of um, uh, the young earth uh, creationism group. If you can't uh, test hypothesis, you don't have science. And I think, you know, in all many of the cases that do reach uh, the higher courts, the, the, um, and very few have reached the Supreme Court other than Everson. Uh, ever since, uh, is because where are the scientists that back or can agree? I mean, there's such immense um, a compilation of e evidence and studies uh, to refute what they're suggesting. All right, but it is uh, it, it it is um, a very uh, Tentious uh, 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 issue, uh, and uh, there's much conflict on it because it is bottom line again. It's about religious values and not wanting to accept modern, modern evol modernity or evolvement, even in, in science or whatever, or, you know, democracy, uh, not accepting that. Go back to the foundation of the U.S., the Declaration of Independence, saying people are created equal. If people aren't created, then it leaves a lot of room for differences within people. And well, the Chinese yeah. historian, the yeah. Chinese have traditionally been oh. the most advanced, the most academic peoples in the world. Well, you know, and Jefferson actually did write papers on that explaining. He didn't really mean uh, equal, mm. but, you know, they were trying to, you know, the Declaration of Independence, what is that? That is a real protest to the King of England. All right. well, it's a piece of so propaganda. So they were throwing really it in his face. The people are created equal. I'm as equal as I'm equal to you. You know, in other words, that's what they were saying. <coughs> they were not thinking of blacks or Chinese or anybody else. <laughs> no, uh, because they were the ones that were actually the decision makers here in our country, weren't they? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, thank you for your patience. You've been wonderful. Thank you.